Hi there, I'm the Myth Keeper. Welcome back to my channel. Now, typically when I do these region deep dives, I haven't been doing a little bit of an intro because they're so long and I don't want to waste any more of your time than I already do. But this week I felt like I had to uh, because I know I'm going to get a bunch of furious comments uh, in the comments below uh, that I'm saying uh, the name of a particular character wrong. Now I'm doing a regional deep dive on Irisin. This is a country that was conquered by the Russian witch Baba Yaga. Uh, it just so happens that uh, I have a Russian partner and when I first recorded this and I called her Baba Yaga, uh, I, uh, I was criticized. So I'm trying as much as possible to use the correct Russian pronunciation. Uh, also, you will note that throughout the video, I refer to the queen as Anastasia and not Anastasia. That's also the Russian way of saying it. And I've tried to do that throughout to the best of my ability. In any case, I think this is some really terrific content. Enjoy. The History of Irisin. As you may know from watching my deep dive video on the lands of the Linorm kings, recorded Iriseni history begins in the year minus five when High King Olaf Hagensborg extended his empire east past the Glacier Lake and the Horwood. However, High King Olaf's United Kingdom only lasted a single year before a stone block crushed his head during an earthquake, and so the lands of modern Iriseni became fractured and divided, warred over by Ulfin raiders who each desired kingship over their small piece of land. For over 3,000 years, Ulfin kings would rise and fall, carving their empires, conquering their neighbors, sometimes uniting their lands, and sometimes splintering them. By the end of the 32nd century, the lands of modern-day Irisin comprised two separate regions, the Kingdom of Remurund, north of the Glacier Lake, and the Dürstor Confederacy, south of the lake. Remurund had been one of the more powerful of the Linorm kingdoms in its time, having been ruled over for many decades by the wise and brave king Ethered, who slew his Linorm in single combat and claimed the blood right to kingship when he was but a boy. King Ethered of the kingdom of Remurund died in 3298, and he was succeeded by his son Yargut. Yargut was considered an intelligent young man, but he had not won over the loyalty of his people as well as he might have, because he did not himself follow in his father's footsteps by hunting and killing a linorm of his own to prove his right to rule. In the south, the Dürstor Confederacy, by contrast, was not a united kingdom at all, but a loose association of thanedoms, ruled over by a number of bickering thanes. In 3312, as has been recounted before, the northern lights flared so brightly during the summer that they were mistaken for the sun. The winter was more bitterly cold than any on record, with swords shattering in the frigid temperatures. Scholars would later believe these to have been omens of that which was to come. The following year, Baba Yega descended upon the kingdom of Remurund from the crown of the world. The witch queen led an army consisting of trolls, frost giants, winter wolves, and icy fey minions, and she preceded her assault by causing an apocalyptic avalanche to roll down from the Winterwall glacier that killed thousands of Ulfin defenders before a single one of her soldiers had set foot on Linorm King soil. Under the leadership of bookish King Yargut, the once proud kingdom of Remurund fell to the witch queen in less than a week. The Dürstor Confederacy to the south did only marginally better, and it held out for 17 days, but it too ultimately succumbed to Baba Yega's otherworldly army. In less than a month, Baba Yega conquered two kingdoms that had stood for centuries and merged them into the nation of Irisin, a land perpetually shrouded in bitter, supernatural winter. Although Baba Yega and her army did not pursue conquest of the Ulfin lands east of Irisin, those lands, cut off as they were from the resources of their western allies, did not last long against the wandering tribes of Frost and Taiga giants, and the raids of the Kelid barbarians of the realms of the Mammoth Lords. After establishing Irisin, however, Baba Yega lost interest and ceded power to her eldest daughter, Jedwiga. As cruel and capable as her mother, Jedwiga divided the kingdom into four provinces, Bleak March, the Horwood, Thronehold and Wintercrux. She directed the building of new cities, constructed by the enslaved Ulfin inhabitants, to serve as provincial capitals. Jedwiga granted her most trusted daughters the title of Duchess, and awarded a fifth province to the capricious and cruel Fay who had aided her mother in conquest, allowing them to do whatever they wished. That province, north of the Frozen Road, would later be called Feyfrost. In the year 3370, the Holvir Gang uprising occurred. Frost giant clans from Holvir Gang declared war on the Fey of Feyfrost due to their erratic and malicious conduct. They descended from the north to take action. Three years later, Queen Jedwiga successfully put down the Frost Giant Rebellion. The borders of Feyfrost were altered so that it was no longer in close proximity to the major Frost Giant strongholds of the Winterwall Glacier. 
the Fey signed Jedwiga's ice compact, agreeing to establish a more traditional capital and restrain their more anarchic brethren from antagonizing the giants. Chill Blight was built on the frozen road, imitating a human city but crafted solely from ice. The Brumal lords refused to relinquish their rights to torment whomever they liked and retreated to their palace in the northeastern reaches of the Feyfrost. In 3374, Queen Jedwiga descended on the Brummel lords and sealed them in their palace with an ancient artifact called the Lock of Pajari. In 3412, the year of the three riders, a trio of mysterious fey riding sorcerous mounts was seen across Irisen. Rumor had it they were passing judgment on those who had failed to keep faith with Baba Yiga. Queen Jedwiga had put a price on the riders' heads, but to no avail. In 3413, Baba Yiga returned to Irisen deposed Queen Jadwiga, and placed her daughter Morganon on the throne as Irisen's second queen. Baba Yiga had taken Jadwiga and the first generation of her children from Galarian, and their fate was never to be known. In 3444, Morganon had discovered a plot by the descendants of Queen Jadwiga in the city of Vonosh, though not in time to prevent the death of her own daughter, the Duchess Anicia. Morganon had descended on the city in righteous fury, putting all of Jedwiga's 1,300 offspring dwelling there and over 3,000 other inhabitants to the sword without trial and obliterating the city. Morganon had commanded that the new capital for Horwood be carved from a giant oak in the Horwood forest. In 3445, the Horwood rebellion occurred. The Ulfin peasants of Horwood, led by their druids, had attempted to stop the desecration of the giant oak ordered by Queen Morganon. Hundreds of the rebels were ritually exsanguinated, their blood fed to the roots of the great oak, corrupting it from the inside. Although the rebellion was short-lived, an underground movement known as the Heralds of Summer's Return was born of its ashes. In 3449, the completion of the city of Horwood had taken place. Ossila Morganon, the third daughter of the reigning queen, was installed as the new Duchess of Horwood in an extravagant ceremony. Clandestine members of the Heralds of Summer's Return managed to disrupt the ceremony, and Duchess Ossila lost her left eye in the violence. Following this, Ossila's first official act as Horwood's Duchess was to have every Ulfin peasant's left eye put out across the entire province. In 3512, the second year of the Three Riders occurred. Repeating the events of 3412, the Black, Red, and White Riders had reappeared in Irisen, roaming the countryside and accosting those who had fallen short. The riders were seen as a sign that Baba Yega would return in a year's time and take Morganon with her. Morganon scoffed at these rumors and had several prominent seers thrown from the walls of the royal palace in White Throne for predicting as much. However, in 3513, Baba Yega did return as promised and deposed Morganon and placed her daughter Ervalain on the throne as Irisen's third queen. In 3514, Irvalane split Wintercrux into two provinces, and the western half, named the Verge, was placed under the control of Irvalane's second son, Casimir. He was charged with harassing the Linorm kings across the western border. Irvalane made the Ulfin town of Morozny, the new capital of Wintercrux, resulting in the city's subsequent growth. In 3613, Baba Yege returned once again, and deposed Irvalane, placing her daughter Pialarain on the throne as Irisen's fourth queen. This event firmly established that each of Baba Yega's daughters only had a century to rule, after which the witch queen would return to take the deposed queen and the first generation of her children away from Galarian. This occurred again in 3713, when Baba Yega returned to depose Pialarain, but Pialarain and her children resisted. Baba Yiga ruthlessly put down the rebellion in a single day, now known as the 24-hour war, and placed her next daughter, Elena, on the throne as Irisen's fifth queen. In 3813, Baba Yiga returned again and deposed Elena, placing her daughter Harkartha on the throne as Irisen's sixth queen. In contrast to her predecessor, Elena serenely announced to her children that they would go with their mother to explore strange worlds and plains. Elena and the first generation of her offspring left Irisen without resistance. In 3816, Harkatha reduced the levies and taxes on peasants by a third, fearing that the onerous demands of previous monarchs were ruining the economic health of the provinces. When word reached White Throne that they were calling her Harkatha the Kind, the queen ordered her soldiers to go from town to town, cutting off the little finger on the right hand of every peasant family's youngest child. Harkatha was no longer referred to as kind, but taxes did remain lowered. In 3913, Baba Yega returned and deposed Harkatha, placing her daughter Sasha on the throne as Irisen's seventh queen. Queen Sasha's first act was to raise levies and taxes to the pre-Harkatha levels. In 3937, the Harkatha rebellion occurred. The descendants of Queen Harkatha attempted to wrest control of Irisen from Queen Sasha and her progeny because of perceived indignities visited upon them by the queen. 
the rebellion ultimately failed, and many Harkatha loyalists were put to the sword. A number of survivors in the conflict retreated to the witch caves of the southern Horwood. In 4013, Baba Yaga returned and deposed Sasha, placing her daughter Karina on the throne as Irisan's eighth queen. In 4079, a small but lethal contingent of Jedwiga Harkatha emerged from the witch caves to terrorize the trade routes and towns of Horwood. Queen Karina's eldest son, General Chernim, defeated the crazed loyalists, and Karina ordered the icy witch cave sealed. In 4113, Babiega returned and deposed Karina, placing her daughter Tashana on the throne as Irisan's ninth queen. In 4155, the Great Eastern War occurred. Queen Tashana committed enormous resources to a full-scale invasion of the realm of the Mammoth Lords, conquering all the lands between the Frozen Road and the Gulick River to the base of the Tusk Mountains. Within a year, Tashana established a new province, Rhyme Tusk, in the conquered lands, and laid the foundations for the provincial capital at Tashagrot. In 4159, Desna's vengeance occurred. A huge force of united mammoth lords, following under the leadership of a ragged priest of Desna named Anuk, drove the Iriseni out of their lands and back across the Gulick River. In 4213, as was expected, Baba Yiga returned, but the transition of power did not go so smoothly this time. That year, Queen Tashana rebelled, in an event that is now called the Witch War. She used the Torque of Kochchi to force the demon lord Kochchi to aid her in the short but bloody rebellion against her mother. Baba Yiga defeated Kochchi, who fled to Ayabaria and captured Tashana before executing her followers and interring them in a hidden necropolis called the Vale of Frozen Tears. Baba Yiga's daughter Velikas ascended the throne as Irisan's tenth queen. In 4225, surveyors discovered rich veins of silver in the western bleak march. The Vault of Silver and Ice was established to exploit these resources. In 4227, following the discovery and exploitation of the new vein of silver, miners working in the Vaults of Silver and Ice contracted a terribly contagious and lethal disease called Chilbane Fever. Hundreds of miners and their overseers died before the vaults were abandoned and sealed, but the epidemic spread, devastating the city of Algid Hart. In desperation, Queen Velikas turned to a priestess of Desna from the realm of the Mammoth Lords, who managed to eradicate most of the contagion, though a lesser strain of the illness could still be contracted. In 4313, Baba Yiga returned, deposed Velikas, and placing her daughter Xenia on the throne as Irisan's 11th queen. In 4378, the Bloodstone Conservatory, a school for conjurers and summoners, was founded in the wilderness of Feyfrost. In 4413, Baba Yiga returned to depose Xenia and place her daughter Betirina on the throne as Irisan's 12th queen. Xenia attempted to take her own life rather than leave Galarian with her mother. Many of Xenia's children did the same, but in the end, Xenia was seen on a balcony of the royal palace with her mother, the deposed queen's wrists bound with bloody bandages. Queen Betirina ascended to the throne the next day. In 4513, Baba Yiga returned, deposed Betirina, and placed her daughter Elizaveta on the throne as Irisan's 13th queen. In 4613, Baba Yiga returned, deposed Elizaveta, and placed her daughter Elvana on the throne as Irisan's 14th queen. In 4642, three dozen prominent descendants of Elizaveta were accused of fomenting rebellion against Queen Elvana. All were found guilty by the Cold Sisters, flayed alive, and frozen into the walls of the royal palace in White Throne. In 4710, Queen Elvana sent her granddaughter Ilivor Karanasi on a mission to Irisan's northernmost reaches. The details were kept secret, but rumors persisted that Ilivor went in search of the Vale of Frozen Tears. In 4711, the mysterious Mineska Ravoyosh appeared in the town of Belila in Bleak March, bringing with her a strange new religion called the Way of Transcendent Bliss. In 4713, the Reign of Winter Adventure Path took place. After 13 cruel queens, the 14th ruler, Elvana, became convinced that she deserved to remain Irisan's ruler forever. As Baba Yega's return drew near, Elvana captured her and took control of her magic, using it to spread Irisan's curse of winter to other lands. However, a band of heroes intervened and freed Baba Yiga, halting Elvana's plot and defeating her. Instead of crowning another one of her daughters, Baba Yiga was convinced to make the resurrected Earth Princess Anastasia Nikolaevna Romanova the new queen of Irisan. Irisan is now ruled by Queen Anastasia, the first queen to ever rule Irisan who is not a winter witch herself, but a mortal human with only trace lineage to the witch queen. She is also not native to Galarian, but an exile from the same world and country that her ancient grandmother Baba Yiga had once hailed from. That is, of course, Earth and Russia, respectively. And Anastasia, or Anastasia in English, is weirdly a real-world historical figure. Wikipedia link in the description below. 
Despite being relatively new to her power, Queen Anastasia's bloodline is strong. Although she comes from a world lacking in magic, her own mastery of the ice magic that is her birthright has been growing by the year since she came to Galarian. It remains to be seen how she will choose to exert this power in her stewardship over Irisen. Despite the change in leadership, Irisen remains an unsafe place, with many of the land's witches viewing Queen Anastasia as a fraud queen, and who may pose a threat to her reign. With so much change, it remains to be seen if Anastasia's rule will match the century-long reigns common among her predecessors, or if her rule will be cut short by her ambitious subjects. Today, Irisen remains a place where winter's icy grip never relents. Although Baba Yiga accepted the Heroes of the Reign of Winter Adventure Path's nomination of the gentler Queen Anastasia to rule the land, for her part, Baba Yiga was unwilling to end the curse of perpetual winter throughout the land. Frost goblins, ice trolls, winter wolves, and other fey creatures thrive, continuing to pose dangers to those who live there. Citizens must focus on surviving each day. Although Queen Anastasia's first few years of reign have caused less agony, it is not seen as a sign of a brighter future. Life in Irisen has always been harsh, and many believe the Queen's kindness is a cruel deception, offering hope only to snatch it away when the citizens begin to trust again. Dissidents and witches from the former ruling castes plot against the Queen, stirring up rebellion. The Linorm kings to the west and the Mammoth lords to the east also pose a constant threat. And though the Iriseni were aggressors in the past, with an inexperienced queen on the throne, a new invasion may happen sooner rather than later. After 1400 years of winter, one can imagine nearly all growing things in Irisen are long dead, or locked in eternal hibernation. The great birches, elms, and oaks of the forest are bare of leaves. And only tall evergreens, such as firs, pines, and spruces, provide a green break to the endless blues and whites of the ice and snow. The one exception to this rule are the coniferous wintry yew trees, believed to have been brought to Galarian from some far-off world by Baba Yiga. This tree is absolutely essential to the survival of many of the species that make their home in Irisen. Wintry yew's cones produce edible seeds year-round, and their bark, which grows back even in Irisen's frigid temperatures when stripped, can be used to nourish both animals and people. Were it not for the wintry yew, known colloquially as the witch tree, it is quite possible no wildlife could survive in this wintry land at all. Although Irisen is populated by a large number of malevolent fey, dangerous icy monsters, winter wolves, trolls, and giants, Irisen does also have a substantive human population. Some of that human population is ethnically Ulfin, as these were their lands prior to the Witch Queen's conquest. Today, however, most of the population is Jedwiga. The Jedwiga are a human ethnicity descended from Irisen's queens, and thus can trace their bloodlines back to Baba Yiga herself. Although the Jedwiga display a markedly peculiar psychology, perhaps a result of their progenitor's otherworldly origin, they are physically identical to other human ethnicities of Galarian. In Irisen, however, Jedwiga is more than just an ethnicity. It is also a symbol of one's position in that nation's social order, namely the highest position. Jedwiga usually take their surnames from their royal antecedents, so a Jedwiga named Ivana, who can trace her lineage back to Queen Karina, would be known as Ivana Karina. However, some Jedwiga have dropped this convention for various reasons, with many assuming surnames that have grown out of Iriseni culture. Although nearly every Jedwiga is well acquainted with her lineage, she may have reasons to keep it hidden from the rest of the world. Given the many feuds and conflicts between descendants of the various queens, this is often an advantage. As with almost every matter in Irisen, it is wise to tread lightly on the subject of pedigree. The Provinces of Irisen Bleak March Bleak March is framed by the ice flow and rime flow rivers to the west and south, Glacier Lake to the east, and the Winterwall Glacier to the north. The province's interior is a snowy wilderness of rolling plains with patches of conifers and dormant leafless deciduous trees. While some herbivorous wildlife has survived in the harsh environment, including various breeds of birds and deer, these lands are often home to less mundane creatures such as yetis and boreal brutes warped by the centuries-long supernatural winter. Except for the occasional peasants venturing away from civilization for fur trapping or hunting, humanoids leave the interior to the beasts. Hungry frost giants and antisocial thugs who resent abiding by their treaties with the white witches travel alone or in small groups and often waylay townsfolk they come across. Some even present themselves to the outskirts of town and demand tribute to leave the settlement intact. Wise townsfolk make sure these intruders get what they want to avoid destruction. Important places in Bleak March include Algidhart. 
Algid Hart was established as a provincial capital by Queen Jedwiga after the Winter War. Its builders created massive walls and towers, but did not anticipate the population growth that followed. As a result, the city's buildings were built vertically on top of one another, creating the soaring districts, connected by a complex network of bridges and platforms. However, many of these structures are vacant, as Algid Hart's upper class never fully recovered from the deadly epidemic that struck 500 years ago. In Algid Hart, one's status is determined by their residence height. The highest and most coveted residences are located in the eight soaring districts at the city centre, where only Jedwiga and wealthy foreigners are allowed to live. A whole arm of the city guard is tasked just with evicting illegal peasant squatters from these spaces. Each soaring district houses a different class of privileged residents. The hanging markets, a collection of suspended platforms, have been a traditional fief of the Jedwiga Morganon for over a millennium. Food and services from across Galarian can be purchased here. The barony is a home to the city's middle-class Jedwiga, while the oldest Jedwiga families reside in Winghammer. Helcott Wedge and Cloudkeep Airy house more recent Jedwiga pedigrees, and foreign traders tend to gather in blood merchant towers. The monstrous population, such as winter wolves and cold fay, reside in the witch spire. Fyodov's Wedge is mostly deserted, but contains laboratories and workshops for those seeking obscure formula and alchemical concoctions. The Tiered Keep, a massive castle, is where the Duchess of Bleakmarch, Winesia Elvana, and her consort Count Pavel hold court. It also houses one of Irison's largest temples to Zon Kuthon. The Sky Bridge connects the barony to the keep's penultimate tier, while the city's bureaucracy operates in the lower levels. The city's storage silos flank the keep, and the parade fields hold the permanent camps of Algetart City Guard, commanded by the summoner Count Pavel and his black bat-like Edelon. Finally, Algid Hart's peasants and slaves live in the districts surrounding the city's towering central quarters, their hovels prohibited by law from standing more than two stories tall. The largest of these districts is Low Winghammer, a slum just south of the Snowrunner Gate where pickpockets are a plague and taverns outnumber every other type of business. Belila. Baroness Frederica, who is great-granddaughter of the former Queen Elvana and her husband Baron Baulak, rule over Belila, a river town on Bleak March's northwestern border. Despite their status, they yearn to be among their own kind in Algid Hart or White Throne. Unfortunately, they take out their frustrations on the powerless peasants who serve them, subjecting them to various petty cruelties, especially those who work in Stony Keep. These peasants are unable to change their position and are bound to obey their baroness's commands. Like others in Irison, they are desperate for something to reignite their dwindling interest in life. Two years ago, a woman named Mineska Roboyosh arrived in Belila, claiming to be from the distant land of Ayobaria and introduced a new faith called the Way of Transcendent Bliss. Some people in town dismissed Mineska's ecstatic ramblings as she paraded around town in colorful silks without being affected by the harsh winter winds. However, today, more than half of the town's population has converted to her religion, including the Baroness and the Baron. The Way of Transcendent Bliss isn't a benign religion, however. It is a demonic cult that worships the demon lord Sifkesh. Mineska conducts ecstatic rituals in a converted chapel of Phrasma that was abandoned by its previous adherents after the church's former priest committed suicide upon realizing the blasphemies he had embraced with the charismatic foreigner. The dead cleric's blood-stained Phrasman vestment still adorn his bones, which serve as the centerpiece of the rededicated chapel. Frost Giant's Fist Fourteen hundred years ago, the frost giant Jarl Sezak led an army of giants and white dragons to victory in the Winter War alongside Baba Yiga. He was a boastful, vainglorious brute, and he complained loudly about not being given the most prestigious and wealthy territories conquered by the Witch Queen. Baba Yiga grew tired of his boasting and gifted him with two things, the ancient keep called Frost Giant's Fist and eternal life. But with these gifts came a price. Jarl Sezak became a skeletal monster, eternal but undead, and was bound to his ancient keep forevermore. He now guards his treasure hoard in the cavernous depths of the keep, venting his undying rage on any who try to steal his wealth. Helken, the Ulfen populace residing in Helken, is occupied with only two matters, ensuring that merchant vessels on Glacier Lake are well-stocked and escorted safely along the coast, lest they incur the wrath of their Jedwiga betters, and collecting a sufficient tribute to be presented to the merciless inhabitants of Scrag Deep, for two decades, the freshwater lake trolls dwelling in the depths of the lake's caverns have demanded payment from Helkin's inhabitants, and the people have paid an immense tribute to avoid brutal attacks by the troll warlord Tirchigak and his tribe. 
The position of mayor, burdened with enforcing exorbitant taxes and tribute demands, is assigned through a lottery system, and the current mayor is Valka Dagsdottir, an Ulfan woman in her fourth year of enduring the townspeople's resentment while ensuring their safety from the aquatic trolls. Valka eagerly searches for foreign adventurers, willing to exchange her knowledge of hidden treasure caches in the bleak March countryside for a percentage of their spoils, hoping to better fulfill Scragdeep's ever-increasing demand. However, Valka's ultimate goal is to persuade daring individuals to confront the Scrags in their icy depths to bring an end to their extortion altogether, a mere pipe dream so far. Holviergang Holviergang is a historic fortress and cavern complex, serving as the traditional seat of the Jarl of all the Iriseni Frost Giants. Currently, Jarl Grunganir, a devoted follower of the demon lord Kotschi, rules from the throne. Although Grunganir had always been loyal to Irisen's previous Queen Elvana and sent regular levies of his household warriors to serve in Queen Elvana's army, he also regularly consulted with the frost giant oracle Heringar the Deathless in the northern Feyfrost and made bloody sacrifices to Kotschi deep in the caverns of the Holvier Gang. With Elvana replaced by Queen Anastasia, the levies are no longer forthcoming and the giants may be mobilizing against her. Holviergang has also served as a meeting place for traders traveling over the crown of the world and the realm of the mammoth lords. Holg Tuskrider, a merchant from Eistair, is a frequent visitor to Holviergang and always brings a gift to the Jarl. He hires mercenaries to disrupt the shipping routes of his trade rivals and rewards them generously for their success. Holviergang is also the setting of the standalone Pathfinder module, the Witch War Legacy. Yensa those rare traders from the lands of the Linorm kings who cross the border into Irisen most often sell their wares in Yensa. The town's ruler is Countess Marcelina, who presents herself as a promoter of commerce and forbids mercenary ruffians from entering her town. In reality, though, she is a cruel creature who terrorizes her subjects. However, the Countess's carefully cultivated image has fooled many foreigners, making Yensa the busiest trading town in western Irisen. The locals of Yensa are aware of their ruler's true nature and live in fear of her, they desperately hope for someone to save them from her cruelty, but they dare not speak out against her. The Feyfrost Located in the northeast corner of Irisen, Feyfrost is bordered by the Winterwall Glacier to the north and the Frozen Road to the south. The region was given to the Cold Fey who aided Baba Yiga in her conquest of Raymerund and the Deerstor Confederacy. For sixty years, these wicked Fey caused mischief and worse to anyone they encountered. The Frost Giants eventually retaliated in a dramatic fashion, declaring war on everything south of the Winterwall Glacier, especially the Fey. This rebellion, known as the Holviergang Uprising, took nearly three years for Queen Jadwiga to quell. Afterward, she changed the borders of Feyfrost to separate the Fey from the Giants, and forced the Fey to sign the Ice Compact, a treaty requiring them to police the behavior of their denizens and create a traditional capital in the Fey city of Chilblight. Although governance of the province is given to the Fey Prince of Chilblight, human settlements in Feyfrost, mostly situated along the banks of the Frozen Road, are ruled by Jedwiga nobles. The rest of the region is comprised of inhospitable tundra and glacial ice, which is only hospitable to the most rugged Arctic creatures. The boundaries between Galarian and the First World are thin here, and the Fey that prowl these lands can easily move between the two worlds. Non-Fey visitors to the region should beware, as the dangers of this icy land are many. Important places in Feyfrost include the capital city of Chilblight. Chilblight, founded in 3373, is a city entirely carved out of ice. It is the second most populous city in the area, boasting a sizable population of over 12,000 Fey inhabitants. Chilblight's governance has changed in the years since its founding, with the current city council consisting of five members elected for hundred-year terms. The council oversees the province's governance, while the mad prince Muxpadi, who sits on a crystalline throne in the Eisrimir Palace, remains in power. Muxpadi's sole remaining duty is to pass judgment on those found to have broken the law, sentencing them to beheading in a daily ritual carried out in the frozen field northeast of the city. Visitors to Chilblight primarily arrive via the frozen road, due to the hazardous overland travel through the Feyfrost. Pug's Wharves, a waterfront area with outrageous tolls and capricious Fey dock workers, leads to many merchants docking at the Cheapside docks. Cheapside is run by Aula Chernevsky, who is on commission from the city council. Visitors must then pass through the Six Tower Gates, the only land route into the city, and pay a toll to obtain travel permits. They will then arrive in the Hovels, a district of igloos and crude shacks of packed snow housing the city's poorest residents, which surrounds a pond with fractured sheets of ice. Una Redtress, the Queen of Beggars, resides here, and every beggar is expected to give a portion of their weekly haul to her. 
Schumer's quarter is south and west of the hovels, dominated by the Huldra Schumer of the Knife, who has made a fortune selling animal furs to merchants. Councillor Boxale runs Boxale's district, where they craft delicate crystal jewellery, which is prized all across Galarian for its craftsmanship. The Forest of Glass, a wooded area where a delicate layer of ice covers the trees, borders Boxale's district. The frozen castle, called the Ice Fort, sits north of the city and houses Chilbright City Guard and their quickling captain, Helfrid the Howler. There are three islands in the river offshore, which are connected to the mainland by two bridges. One of them is named after the councillor Baza and is the location of his money-lending empire and a pawn business run by a twisted satyr who mostly deals in the souls of desperate individuals. The second island is Trident Isle, where the mad prince Max Paddy sits on his throne and holds weekly gladiatorial contests at the Great Trident Colosseum, which is hugely popular with Chilblight residents, many of whom are avid gamblers. Criminals found guilty of crimes are sometimes spared the predictable judgment of Max Paddy and offered a pardon if they can survive the games in this bloody amphitheatre. The largest of the three islands, Child Thief Island, is dominated by city councillor Skirgmoy, who traffics in children stolen from the towns of Irisin and elsewhere, a booming industry much hated by the peasants whose offspring are the commodity. Skirgmoy also controls Chilblight's food supplies, which are sold in two markets that sit upon the frozen ponds flanking his massive angular manor. Zarni Lass Zarni Lass, a small stone town in the midst of a vast snowy wilderness, was not originally an Ulfin settlement. It was founded during Queen Xenia's reign, when her daughter discovered the area's convergence of arcane energies made it an ideal location for conjuration magic. Queen Xenia established the Bloodstone Conservatory, a training academy for conjurers and summoners to perfect their skills, and the town grew around it to provide support. The academy is overseen by head preceptor Zenovia Xenia, who, along with her faculty of six, are descendants of Xenia as well. Up to 20 students can be enrolled at the academy at any time, which has a reputation for grueling training but luxurious living. The application process is so convoluted and arbitrary that most eventually give up after exhausting their funds or patience. The peasants of Zarni Lass profit from catering to potential students, while they await admission, and the town's supply needs are met by agents in Chilblight. However, the journey to Zarni Lass is treacherous, and local businesses cater to hopeful and wealthy applicants seeking accommodation, food, and entertainment. The Summoner's Hearth, run by a Jadwiga woman named Ingveld and her three daughters, is a popular inn in town. Heringar's Keep Heringar's Keep predates the arrival of Baba Yiga in Galarian, and it is an imposing stronghold that has stood for ages. It has towering walls and 18 icy stone spires guarded by vigilant ice elementals. Its principal occupant is Heringar the Everlasting, a revered seer and oracle among the frost giants of the Winterwall Glacier in Irison. Even the great Jarl Grunganir of Holvir Gang seeks counsel and blessings from this ancient being for his plans. The Palace of the Brummel Lords The Palace of the Brummel Lords was built by Balok, Nojek, and Yalo, three fey elders who were peculiar and malevolent and who terrorized the Ulfin settlements with their merciless attacks for generations, even before the Winter War. After the Winter War, they constructed a palace of ice and stone in the newly formed Feyfrost and named themselves the Brummel Lords. During the Holvier Gang uprising, they refused to sign Queen Jadwiga's ice compact and retreated to their fortress. The Queen did not take any action at first, but when she finally led an assault on the Brummel Lords, she used a powerful artifact to trap them in their ice castle where they have remained imprisoned even to the present day. Thronehold in Irison, each province is designed to support and provide for its designated capital city, and this is particularly evident in Thronehold, which serves as the home of the national capital, White Throne. Every village and town within Thronehold, situated along Glacier Lake or the three surrounding rivers, serves as a critical stopover for the constant stream of imported goods on their way to White Throne. The vast expanses between settlements are both treacherous and inhospitable, with only the witch trees providing sustenance for the local wildlife. As a result, few people travel overland in Thronehold due to the harsh weather and danger, with most preferring to use covered barges to navigate the frozen road, Gulick River, and Glacier Lake to avoid the province's interior. Important places in Thronehold include White Throne, the capital of Irison, which was established by Baba Yiga herself on the ruins of the Remurund capital of Elkswode, sits on the northern shore of Glacier Lake, and its roads are paved with the skulls of slain Ulfen warriors. The city is diverse and includes Jedwiga, Ulfen, Dwarves, Fey, Gnomes, Ice Trolls, Snow Goblins, and Winter Wolves who live together in relative stability. However, most Dwarven, Gnome, and Ulfen residents are slaves, and the visiting merchants, diplomats, and adventurers confine themselves to the merchants' quarter around White Throne's Market Square. 
The city is several districts, including the woodcrafters and scholars in the Two Hill area, with Vizcaya Hill and Observatory Hill nearby. The latter is home to the Observatory Arcanus, a font of knowledge about the heavens. The conservative district of Ironside is home to the Iron Barracks, Irison's Iron Guard. Frost Hall is where many wealthy Jadwiga reside. The Frost Hall Theatre is the artistic centre of White Throne, and Porcelain Street is where visitors can buy the city's iconic dolls. The Flows is White Throne's most elite neighbourhood. Built on islands north of the Royal Palace and home to many functionaries who serve Queen Estesia and Irison's government. The Water Palace serves as a luxurious bathhouse for only the privileged, and its hot springs heat the hidden gardens, where about a third of the city's fruits and vegetables are grown. The city also has several monstrous enclaves, including the Troll Quarter in the southeast, the Howlings District, where winter wolves primarily congregate, and the Rat Nest, an underground warren where snow goblins live. The Ifang Arena hosts nightly bouts for territorial males to battle for status or to redress grudges. Outside the city walls sits the Bone Mill, where those unable to afford a burial plot in Rhymerest Cemetery are sent to be rendered for all of their remaining resources. White Throne's gangs, called the Stilyagi, gather near Hammerdown Fountain in Ironside, under the ostensible leadership of their eccentric prince, Pavel Turovsky. Queen Anastasia rules all of Irison from the royal palace, a magnificent structure of ice sitting atop an enormous pillar that rises 200 feet from the surface of Glacier Lake. Prior to the events of the Reign of Winter Adventure Path, Queen Elvana's eldest daughter, Princess Cassisoce, was the Duchess of Thronehold, and responsible for the administration of the province and the city of White Throne itself. It is not known who the current Duke or Duchess of Thronehold is today. Badeland. Badeland is a peasant town located along the frozen road, and shares a border with the Fey of Feyfrost. The town is surrounded by high walls and guards to keep a vigilant watch to prevent any uninvited Fey visitors from causing trouble. The Fey of Feyfrost are infamous for stealing children, and so the town is always on high alert to protect its young ones. Merchants passing through the area often stop in Badeland to rest and recuperate, as the town's inns and taverns are known for their warm hospitality. The town is governed wisely by Baroness Pavlina and her Ulfin husband, Odvar Pavelson. Baroness Pavlina's marriage to a peasant and her kindness to servants and slaves marked her as a black sheep in Algidhart, and she was sent to Badeland as a punishment. However, Lady Pavlina has done an excellent job of making life bearable for her subjects for the past 22 years. She is known to have paid from her own pockets to send mercenary groups north to retrieve stolen children from the Fey. Some of the thriving retrieval companies in town include Home Again Safe, run by Helena Ukarnian, and the White Dawn Hunters, led by Mikhail Shalanov. Both companies frequently hire freelancers willing to track down elusive Fey or those who have absconded with a child. Hagby. Hagby is a town in the west, which serves as the last trade stop before White Throne. The residents of Hagsby are paranoid and suspicious due to the cruel and exacting rule of Baroness Ladina, who punishes even the slightest hint of laziness or corruption with harsh penalties. Ladenica. Ladenica, Thronehold's only town on the Marble Flow River, is a busy town fortified against wintry terrors that shamble out of the frozen fog. Baroness Helka rules Ladenica from her round stone keep and is known to hire mercenaries and adventurers to deal with threats. Her Jedwiga guard captain, Vlad Omelensky, handles all contracts for business, but is notorious for cheating his hires to fill his own coffers. Ladenica is also renowned for some of its lavish inns, Natalia's Riverside Inn, the Spirit's Caress, and the White Raven. The Ruins of Tashkarot. Tashkarot, the former provincial capital of Rhymetusk, was the only structure left standing after Queen Tashana's Great Eastern War. The ruins now lie abandoned on the eastern banks of the Gulik River. The Kelids avoid the area, and most Iriseni cannot reach it, as it is claimed to be haunted by the spirits of the residents who were killed when the Mammoth Lords conquered the city and reclaimed their ancestral lands. Eterjorna. For generations, the town of Eterjorna has shamelessly exploited its advantageous position on the far eastern shore of Glacier Lake. Any goods traveling up the Marble Flow River towards White Throne are required to pass through Eterjorna, unless the risk of crossing the treacherous middle of the lake is preferred. The corruption in Eterjorna is well known, ranging from basic bribery to covert looting, and it permeates almost all levels of society, from the humble dock worker to Baroness Edrigiana herself. Everyone in the town seems to be engaging in some form of embezzlement, theft, or graft. While such practices are to be expected in rich port cities, Eterjorna has elevated them to an art form. The Verge Upon ascending to the throne, Queen Irvalaine recognized that maintaining a constant state of military aggression towards her neighbors was not sustainable for Irson's survival. Previous rulers had drained the nation's resources to provide for their armies and conquered Ulfin population, leaving Irison vulnerable. 
Irvaline decided to focus on building up Irison's power and infrastructure instead of relying solely on military might. To maintain a sense of fear among their neighbors, Irvaline created a new province, the Verge, under the control of her second son, Casimir. His task was to train and strengthen the military, conduct raids on the borders, and avoid an all-out war. This arrangement allowed Irison to focus on building trade routes to sustain the nation, while the Verge remained militarized, with settlements dedicated to supporting Irison's armies. The Verge is the only province in Irison traditionally ruled by a man, with the reigning queen's second son typically being appointed as military governor. With the ascension of the childless Queen Anastasia, it is not known who is currently the Lord Commander of the Verge, though it may still be Queen Elvana's second son, Duke Arvanov Elvana, who had his left hand cut off by his own mother after his first defeat. Duke Arvanov took to wearing the hand as a grim reminder of the stakes of his position on an iron chain about his neck. Important places in the Verge include Redtooth. Redtooth is a large town that serves as the provincial capital of the Verge and headquarters of Irison's military. It is also the official seat of the military governor of the Verge, governed by Queen Elvana's second son, Arvanov Elvana, who is the Duke of Redtooth. The town's Keep of the Hound, an imposing stone castle, is where the Duke directs all Western military operations. Lady Shannon Betirina, the Duke's wife, was afflicted with lycanthropy several years ago, a shameful secret the Duke has been keeping semi-successfully for many years. Redtooth is home to many winter wolves who can assume human form, and it is nearly impossible to distinguish between humans and winter wolves since virtually all residents possess white or silver hair. The winter wolves are bound by an ancient pact that prohibits them from opening closed gates without invitation. To keep the peace, a self-imposed curfew is followed by the human residents of the town at dusk. Redtooth lacks walls, and instead the town is encircled with a ring of rectangular wooden towers that serve as barracks for Redtooth City Watch, the Red Claws. Captain Rogosh Vix, a winter wolf who remains in human form, commands the Red Claws. Redtooth's population lives in neighborhoods surrounding the keep, storage silos, and army camps. The Blue Fang District, located west of the Duke's castle, is home to nearly half of the town's winter wolves, and the only inn in town, the Open Claw. The Clawfoot Quarter, located south of Blue Fang, is home to rowdy taverns and some temporary markets that are erected in the mornings and disassembled before dusk. The neighborhoods of Whitetail and Hounds Range are home to the Jedwiga middle class, as well as the city's armorers. For the most part, Redtooth's armorers craft inferior armor, but are reckoned to be much better at repairing damage than their counterparts in Morozny. Sarbotten. Sarbotten is a border town that has always supported and encouraged raids into the lands of the Linarm Kings. Baroness Urgalena fulfills her aristocratic role with bloodthirsty enthusiasm, and she annually hosts the Crimson Tournament, in which combatants fight to the death for the prize of a kiss from her. She has always been very competitive with her sister Nadia, the Baroness of the Wintercrux town of Dallin, and is even thought to have spies in her sister's midst so she can coordinate raids specifically to embarrass Lady Nadia's diplomatic endeavors. Three Troll if Redtooth holds the highest concentration of winter wolves in the Verge, then Three Troll is where ice trolls gather in the greatest numbers. Three Troll is a small town that began as a camp for ice troll raiders making forays into the neighboring Grungir forest. The town is nominally ruled by Baroness Nadielka, but she rarely sets foot there, leaving the ice trolls to govern themselves, which in turn has led the unruly ice trolls to a state of near anarchy. Vasterborg Vasterborg is a heavily fortified town near the border with the lands of the Linorm Kings. It boasts a large population of soldiers, humans, ice trolls, and winter wolves. Its many industries cater the army, including taverns, brothels, fighting pits, and coursing fields where winter wolves hunt condemned criminals, debtors, and prisoners of war. Velekia Nora. Discipline in Irison's military has traditionally been as severe as its queen's. With Jedwiga officers commanding troops of surly, ulfen, roaring, frost giants, bloodthirsty ice trolls, volatile winter wolves, and a dozen other monstrous races, order must be maintained at all costs. The most extreme form of discipline is to be sent to Velekianora. Deserters sent here are punished with death, but that is not the end. Necromancers take the corpses of these soldiers and add them to the ranks of the decimated, a small army of undead soldiers that drill eternally in the white wastes a few miles southeast of Velekianora. Presently, this brigade is about 2,500 strong, led by the Grave Knight General Fyodor Yelizaveta. Zelen. Of all of the Verge's peasant settlements, Zelen is the one least touched by the martial ethos of the province. Its riverfront teems with activity, handling merchant barges heading east and west, and most river captains take advantage of Zelen to sleep in a warm bed for at least one night. The waters of the Rhineflow are particularly rich with fish near Zelen, and the town ends up sending a good deal of its catch as far south as Redtooth. In fact, the Vasterborg Run, a caravan of dog sleds, makes a monthly trip to the river's bounty between Zelen and Redtooth. 
Winter Crux. Winter Crux is an important province in Irisin, sometimes considered the region's heartland, as it produces much needed ore and wealth. The province is well protected, bounded by Glacier Lake, the Rhineflow and Marble Flow rivers, the Kodar Mountains, and the militarized Verge province. The capital city, Morozny on the Rhineflow River, turns the ore into armor, weapons, and luxuries for export. Despite its wealth, most of Winter Crux's people live in settlements along the river. Those who work in the mines of the Scala foothills or are enslaved in the mines of Hope Lost face many dangers, including frost drakes, ice trolls, territorial ogres, and frost giant raiders from the Kodar Mountains who covet Winter Crux's wealth. Places of interest in Winter Crux include Morozny, Winter Crux's capital. Fourteen centuries ago, Morozny surrendered to Baba Yiga's army without resistance from the Deerstor Confederacy. Despite this, the town was chosen as the new capital for Winter Crux when Queen Ervalet needed a new one after the creation of the Verge. Morozny's metalworking industry, which produces armor and weapons for all of Irisin and exports abroad, makes up a large part of the town's economy. The town is home to several districts, including Coalblack, Grandbridge, Thieves Quarter, Vilcoma, Fishmonger, Rhymeflow, Sootsteel, and Peskynek. The Grain Factors Quarter on Grand Isle is where the city's wealthy Jadwiga families reside. Here, local merchant princess Yulia de Proba manipulates the grain market every year, and has thus become one of Irison's wealthiest citizens as a result. The Sootsteel Quarter is known for its gold, silver, and platinum filigree crafters. On Castle Isle, the Karamita Keep, home to the Duchess of Wintercrux, Zvitochka Elvana, dominates the island. The bridge from Sootsteel Quarter to Castle Isle is typically forbidden to all non-Jadwiga without a special pass issued at the South Gatehouse. Dallin the town of Dallin relies on trade with the outside world for its own survival, but it must frequently apologize to its Linorm Kingdom neighbors for raids launched from Red Tooth and Sarbottom in the verge of the west. Baroness Nadia rules Dallin and tries to maintain stable relations with Southmore and Verissia, but her efforts are often sabotaged by her bloodthirsty sister, Baroness Ergalena of Sarbottom. Dobrova Baron Vasil Yelizaveta rules Dobrova, the northernmost town on the Marble Flow River in Wintercrux, and is suspected of murdering his wife, Baroness Yavona, who apparently committed suicide some years ago. Dobrova is burdened with high taxes, and the peasants fear Lord Vasil's unnatural fondness for the rack. The town would like to see him proven guilty of the Baroness's murder, which would result in his removal from Dobrova, but no one has been willing to investigate for fear of Vasil's rack. Hope Lost the name Hope Lost is a fitting descriptor for a place that receives dissidents and fools who have earned the ire of the White Witches or the Cold Sisters. The forced labor in the icy mines of Hope Lost is a clear death sentence. The rare blue quartz crystals known as ice diamonds are notoriously difficult to excavate, and the lives of the slaves forced to work the mines are brutal and brief. Countess Grinalese, a thoroughly depraved and vicious white witch known to have a taste for human flesh, oversees the mines. Any inmate working in the mines would rather endure the daily brutal beatings of ice troll gang bosses than receive an invitation to the Countess's palace, an edifice carved into the face of the mountains by slave labor. The screams emanating from those cold halls during her infamous orgies of cannibalism and torture can bring even the strongest soul to tears. Occasionally, a prominent Ulfen family of means will try to hire adventurers to rescue a loved one sent to the mines, but most decline such hopeless commissions, no matter what the reward is. Yarna. Yarna's hot springs directly to the west make it a popular destination for Jedwiga and wealthy foreign merchants alike, and the town's industries are designed accordingly. Three separate resorts cater to the extravagant tastes of the aristocracy, as do restaurants that serve rich foods and two grand theatres that offer a wide variety of nightly entertainment. Arrogant Iriseni bards who would never be caught dead in most Ilfen peasant towns consider performing in Yarna a prestigious gig. The hot springs themselves began bubbling up beneath the frozen ground some 200 years ago, and are believed to have magical and medicinal powers, including the power to prolong life. To date, no one has proven such assertions. Nevertheless, hundreds of aging and ailing Jedwiga bathe in the waters every year. Many alchemists report promising outcomes from samples of the mineral-rich waters and come to town to collect vials of it, though their prices are very steep. Sarabi the town of Sarabi lies on the Thundering River, and Verissian merchants who cross the Kodar Mountains into Irisin can profit by delivering their goods, mostly grain and foodstuffs, to this bustling peasant town. The ruling Baroness Zoja is a judicious white witch who accounts for every crate that passes through Sarabi. Most of the cargo moves west to Dallin, and on to the militant settlements and camps of the Verge, but the rest follows the Sarabi Trail eastward. The wintry journey is perilous, as it follows no visible road, and the travelers risk their lives each time they make the trip. The journey passes through the Kodar Mountains, heads north, and stops briefly at Hope Lost before continuing east to Sasulka. 
Intrepid crews go directly to Sasulka, while the more cautious ones follow one of the well-traveled roads to the Scala foothills to Zlatomesto. There they join a heavily guarded Zlatomesto caravan of ore and quarried stone for a safer journey to Veshtak, where the town takes a bigger bite from potential profits too. However, the white-furred peritons that prey on travelers to Sasulka can take bites too, and their bites draw blood. Sosulka. The ruler of Sosulka, Baroness Vilhema, cannot sleep at night because she is convinced that she is being cheated by the peasants upriver in Veshtak. She believes that there is a vast peasant conspiracy in Ursin, centered in Wintercrux and intent on mocking her. She is not entirely wrong in her paranoia. Lady Vilhema does not see the daily theft going on in her domain, as her steward, Maxim Gerenatsov, is secretly a member of the Heralds of Summer's Return and regularly arranges the theft or looting of shipments to help the cause. The Thane Graves. The Thane Graves, a hilly region where the Thanes of the Deerster Confederacy were interred in wealth and splendor, in burial mounds, tombs, and monuments, have mostly been forgotten by the Ulfin inhabitants of Hirson. The armies of Baba Yiga conquered the squabbling Thanedoms in the Winter War, an eternal winter settled over the lands of Irison, burying the burial mounds, tombs, and monuments of the Thane Graves in snow. However, various Arctic creatures have rediscovered the Thane Graves and claimed the area as their home. Treasure seekers who search for the riches said to be buried beneath the mounds are drawn to the Thane Graves, but few explorers have returned alive. Traps and undead guardians watch over the icy tombs, and two ogre tribes claim the region, constantly fighting over territory, hidden wealth, and control of the undead minions guarding the tombs. Veshtak. This corrupt town, situated on the Marble Flow River, is the first place Wintercrux merchants encounter when traveling north with their goods, and the second stop for ice diamond shipments from the mines of Hope Lost. Thanks to bribes and political connections, Veshtak governs itself and takes advantage of its strategic location by imposing high tariffs, soliciting bribes, and skimming profits off every cargo. Although Duchess Vitochka rules from Morozny, the Cold Sisters monitor the Ulfin townsfolk of Veshtak and bring corrupt officials to justice. The Cold Sisters, who have been mentioned a few times before, are an order of winter witches who are charged with enforcing Irison's strict laws throughout the town. The town square displays the bones of many former mayors, dock wardens, warehouse managers, and other greedy officials. The current mayor, Vidloff Haradson, works in close conjunction with the second-in-command, Marina Netsky, who has rumored plans to betray him to save herself if the Cold Sisters should return. Volfast's tower is home to Volfast Raven Banner, once a human lord who was transformed into an undead grave knight by Queen Sasha over 750 years ago. Volfast vowed to defend Queen Sasha from the frozen fog, but now stands watch from his lichen-encrusted black stone tower accompanied by whites and shadows. Volfast is cursed to remain there until someone defeats him in single combat, which few are willing to attempt. According to local legend, the one who defeats Volfast will inherit his post and the great wealth hidden in his tower. Zaplava a tiny village located on the banks of the Rhymeflow River, serving as the last stop on the journey east before Glacier Lake. The population of the village is ruled by fear and superstition, due to the frozen fog and the icy horrors that occasionally wander into the sea. The seven intermarried families of Zaplava struggle to survive through miserly living and the scarce charity that river traffic provides. Arco Arkison serves as the village mayor, but fear and superstition truly rule the population. Surprisingly, several renowned Iriseni adventurers, including Todora Navanya, are from this tiny settlement. Zlatomesto, the central shipping hub for the Ice Diamonds Mined and Hope Lost, and other valuable resources, is a grim place controlled by Baroness Sabina Xenia and her five dower offspring. Zlatomesto's peasants are little better off than slaves, forced into backbreaking labor day and night to load sledges and wagons with goods for transport east. The Tin King Alley Tavern, run by Lee Sunetsky, serves famously potent potato vodka and is frequented by whip-wielding masters of the work gangs. Lee Su secretly works as an agent for the Heralds of Summer's Return, gathering information from drunken patrons to identify lucrative shipments heading east to be waylaid for the cause. The Horwood. Once a thriving forest full of proud tall trees and vibrant druidic culture, Horwood Forest now serves as a chilling reminder of Irison's eternal winter. The provincial capital of Horwood, Vonosh, was destroyed in 3444, when descendants of Queen Jedwiga plotted to overthrow Queen Morganon and kill her daughter, Duchess Ansia. In retaliation, Queen Morganon massacred the residents of Vonosh, regardless of their guilt or innocence, and destroyed the city with fire and ice. She then ordered the creation of a new capital from an enormous oak tree, which had been sacred to the Ulfin druids of the Horwood, resulting in a fierce uprising by the druids and peasants. Despite being crushed by weapons and witchcraft, the rebellion birthed an underground Ulfin resistance movement, the Heralds of Summer's Return. 
The artisans spent four years constructing the new capital, named after the province. However, during the city's dedication ceremony, hosted by the new Duchess Osilla Morganon, the Heralds of Summer's Return launched a suicidal attack, resulting in Osilla losing an eye. As her first act as Duchess of Horwood, she ordered every peasant in the province suffer the same fate, a brutal order that her troops carried out, putting out the left eye of every peasant one by one. Though the Heralds of Summer's Return failed in their initial attack, the movement persisted, engaging in clandestine sabotage and holding on to hope for the defeat of the White Witches. Despite little progress over the past 1,200 years, the Ulfin people's oral traditions keep the embers of revolution alive, ready to ignite if given the opportunity. The capital of this region is the city of Horwood. The city of Horwood in Galarian is a unique settlement that houses almost 9,000 people, carved out from a giant oak tree in the middle of the forest with a diameter of 500 feet at its base and towering thousands of feet in the air. The tree was sacred to the druids of Irison's conquered native Ulfin population, and its leader's uprising was ended by sacrificing the once mighty tree, believed to have been planted by Gosray at the dawn of time. While a large portion of the city nestles in among the tree's sprawling roots and is home to the majority of Horwood's peasants, most of the city's Jedwiga inhabitants reside along a broad avenue carved into the great trunk in a counterclockwise corkscrew. This concourse rises hundreds of feet into the air, winding past hundreds of rooms, balconies, patios, and overhangs painted in vibrant colors and decorated with delicate woodwork. It took hundreds of carpenters, artisans, and woodworkers from every corner of Irison over four years to complete the monumental task. The city proper stops at the tree's branches, and its upper reaches are reserved for the Duchess's arboreal palace. The palace is connected by a complex system of elevators operated by ice trolls and frost giants overseen by Nefger VI. The palace contains extensive bedchambers, concert halls, dining salons, parlors, and theaters, and is the official residence of Duchess Annalisha Elvana, who, along with her brother and consort, Duke Grathis Elvana, conducts endless parties, entertaining numerous Jedwiga, foreign dignitaries, prosperous merchants, and prominent artists and performers. Overseeing all this debauchery is the Arboreal Palace's master of festivities, Bologrod Mensk, who wields vast power and is feared by every non-Jedwiga in the city and some members of the aristocracy. The palace's army of cooks is commanded by Petir Imanova, who is also the leader of a cell of the Heralds of Summer's Return within the Horwood, coordinating various plots against the aristocrats. Most non-Jedwiga living in the Horwood are slaves, including a considerable array of bureaucrats who manage the governing of the province while the rulers indulge their excesses. Other places of interest in the Horwood include Damartorp, a riverfront town ruled by twin sisters Teresa and Sviata, who maintain their power through a constant tug of war with the peasantry. The baronesses are stunningly beautiful, with sharp minds, and hold control over different parts of the town. The townspeople are so divided that they do not frequent the same markets or taverns or on separate docks, and spit on the ground when passing each other. Visitors to Damartorp must be cautious not to get caught up in the ongoing feud. It is believed if the sisters could focus their energies on the bandits who robbed the trade to the Horwood instead of on each other, they would profit immensely. Kizobran is another peasant settlement on the Gulik, catering to merchant traffic on the river. Baroness Hedvika and Baron Gorny, the previous rulers of Kizobran, died in a fire and were succeeded by their daughter, Baroness Vevien, who is actually an imposter. She set the fire that killed her predecessor and is the offspring of a boreal green hag and a charmed Jedwiga man. Lady Vivienne is cruel to the peasants of Kizobran, who live in destitution due to the high taxes she imposes. She also has a habit of kidnapping people for her own pleasure, leaving them frozen in the snow or floating in the Gulik River when she is finished with them. Lode is the first stop in the journey north of the Marble Flow River, and its inhabitants seem more friendly than other Iriseni towns. The riverfront has extensive wharves and warehouses catering to merchants and their crews. Seven inns sit close to the docks, including the Boar's Head, which is renowned for its attached brothel and gambling house run by the Nabatov siblings. Vilma Lochnik, the wealthy owner of half a dozen warehouses, is secretly a member of the Heralds of Summer's Return, smuggling political refugees out of Irison through Lode. Lode's ruler, Baroness Arisa, has tried to deal with the organized bandits that plague the trade routes from Lode to the provincial capital, but her efforts have so far been unsuccessful. However, the profits from shipments that make it through Horwood are still significant enough to persuade some to brave the perilous overland trade route. Lady Arisa would likely pay a handsome bounty to anyone who could eradicate the Bitter Brotherhood, the gang of bandits operating in the area. Ludovni Ludovni has been the primary supplier of Horwood's provincial capital for years, thanks to the diabolical conniving of the Jedwiga clan that maintains Ludovni as its personal fiefdom. Countess Natalka Elena upholds the family tradition of using any means necessary to ensure that more efficient and logical trade routes to the Horwood are kept to an ineffective trickle. 
Lady Natalka's martial sons, Laszlo and Ludvak, pull the strings of the Bitter Brotherhood, the gang of bandits who plague the trade routes from Lowe to Dammertop to the capital. The Countess's youngest daughter, Bozidara, lives in Horwood and attends the endless parties of the Duchess. Nadzieja Lato Nadzieja Lato is the first Iriseni town that traders and merchants from the realm of the Mammoth Lords encounter as they use the Red Fox River to transport their wares into Irisen. The town is ruled by Baroness Cassandra. Although she presents a warm facade to her visitors, her sinister and cold nature is hidden beneath it. The Baroness is known for punishing her subjects with knives and brazers in the cold dungeons beneath her keep, and peasants live in terror of displeasing her. Her biggest challenge is freeing up the potentially lucrative overland trade route to Horwood, which has remained closed for centuries due to the machinations of the town of Ludovny. Hako Harbovich, the chief of Nadzieja Lato's busy docks, ensures that goods are loaded and unloaded quickly and efficiently. He also leads a cell of the Heralds of Summer's Return, and Vlad Petrobovny, the obsequious informant for Baroness Cassandra, is his perpetual foe. Reba Reba sits on the eastern banks of the Marble Flow, facilitating the traffic of goods up the river to Glacier Lake. Most of Reba's townsfolks are peasants of wolf and stock, and those who don't own businesses lead simple lives as dock workers or fisherfolk. They are a superstitious lot, fearful of the magics of the White Witches, and are prone to gossip. Many of the town's residents follow Farasma, with family plots in the cemetery on the north side of town. Errol Snorrison, who presides over Reba's Farasman congregation and serves as the town's undertaker, built up his muscles by digging up the frozen ground for burials. Recently, a Jadwiga woman named Vadia Metanova has been drawing Ulfan worshippers away from their ancestors' faith and attracting them to the newer temple of Zon Kuthon. Otho Bekodsky manages Reba's docks from his riverside manor and pays the proper duties to Baroness Erzabet while skimming a little off the top himself. Olga Halsonovna and her nieces and nephews run the town's largest hostel, the Fireside Inn. Reba's ruler, Baroness Erzabet, has been in her current post for only a year. A young woman of exceptional beauty and talent, Erzabet is a great-granddaughter of the former Queen Elvana and was sent to this post by the Queen after her scandalous love affair with a foreign alchemist from Ustalov. The Baroness is mercurial and emotionally fragile, and her servants and Reba's peasants treat her with unfailing respect while carefully attempting to read her emotional state. 